Okay. Uh, we're still on stage five of the, uh, the resolution phase. Stage five, part three, the mediator techniques and points for consideration. You want to make sure that you're, when you're writing up these agreements, that you're specific. That, that the understanding and realistic as to the details of the agreement. Really, the easiest way to say this is don't try to write this in legalese. Don't try to say the first party, the third party, and so on and so on and so forth, even if you knew what that really meant. You want to write these agreements up so that if an uninvolved third party was to read this agreement, they would have no doubt about what was intended and what was supposed to happen by this agreement. Okay? If somebody that, that didn't have the opportunity to sit through the, the process and didn't even see how we got up to what it is that we're agreeing to, that they could take a look at this agreement and know exactly what needed to be done or what was supposed to be done. Okay? That's the easiest way to cut to the chase on all this stuff. Uh, you need to make sure that, uh, that the actions outlined in the agreement may never be, that you want to make sure that they're going to be carried out and that they're not going to lead to future problems, at least future problems on the surface. Okay? Much like the example I gave on the mediation where the people attended the same, you know, their big hangout was this same bar or club and you know, they, one of them wanted to put into the agreement that, that they would never be there at the same time. Well, first of all, it was a big club, and second of all, since all of their friends were there, what was the likelihood that they were ever going to, uh, to abide by that part of the agreement? Now, you wouldn't know that unless you had sat through the whole, the whole mediation process and knew that, you know, that's where, you know, 99% of, of their, their friends lived was in this club. And so, the, it, so you need to do this reality check, you know, are they really going to be able to live up to it? So just because people want something in an agreement, do the reality check. You know, if you think that there might be a problem with them, w with whatever it is that they're asking you to put into this agreement, ask them. Ask them, well, you know, gee, how, is, how, do, you, how do you think that's going to work? Tell me how do you expect them to abide by this? What do you think is going to happen the first time you show up there and he's there? Does that mean that he's going to have to leave or that you can't go in even though you have your plans set for the afternoon? So do a reality check on, on whatever it might be. State clearly who is agreeing to what, when, where, and how. Typically why is not an issue. Okay. And it, it needs to be simple. It needs to be simple. Let's say that in, in an agreement that, that uh, Bill has agreed to pay Sue $500, okay? Bill agrees to pay Sue $500, okay? What's wrong with this statement? Well, you need to say how, when. Okay, let's, let's just start with how. Okay, how? How is Bill going to pay Sue? Okay, well, let's say he's going to pay her in cash. Okay, he's going to pay her in cash. What else would fall under the how? How many installments? Ah, oh, how many installments? Okay, how many installments, which I think we want it to in this agreement, because that's still, what we want to do is eliminate any possible ambiguity. Okay, so we're going to, so right now we can change this to say bill, and, and by the way, when we're writing these agreements out, you know, I just number them, items one through however many, item one. Bill agrees to pay Sue $500. Well, now how about the way I've got $500? Could, could that be misinterpreted? Could it be? What if I just, if I leave the point and the double O, $500? Sonny? 
write out the words as well. I always write out the words as well, just so that there's no misinterpretation, just so that people don't, I, I, I put the decimal place, point, and then I may put it in parentheses or not, you know. I almost wrote five there. Five hundred dollars. Okay? In one payment. Okay? What what else what else do we need to know here? That's the how. What about the what? Is the what covered? Okay. What other information do we need to know here? When. 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 Okay. When. Is, so we're going to say no later than, let's say if the terms of the agreement were by the end of the month, let's say no later than, and this is, uh, what month are we in? June. June. And so how many days in June? 30. 30. January, February, March, April. Uh, any of y'all do that? Were y'all taught that? Yeah. Uh, so 30, uh, in one payment, no later than, and I would write that out, 30th of June of 2004. Okay. What, what else is still, we're not quite sure about? Where. 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 Okay. Where. Okay. And so, and Sue, where do you want this? Well, I want it delivered to my house. Okay. So, uh, am I hearing you say you want it mailed to your house? Okay. Mailed to your house. 30th June by U.S. Postal Service mail. Okay, what else do we not have on here? Still missing something. Okay, well, oh, we could we could clarify the no later than than uh, than uh, 5 p.m. 30th of June. But we don't. The mail may run later than that, or earlier than that. So, or there may be a problem with the mail. So, depending on how the delivery method is, might pick the time. But time's always good to have on there. What else? You haven't we stated have where it's being mailed to. Well, being mailed to. That's right. To by U.S. mail to uh, Sue's home address of twelve sixteen Main Street. Okay, what else? I think you need to state whether it's going to be cash, cashier's check, or what? $500 in, because sometimes this gets to be a sticking point. In what form are they going to pay it? I had one mediation where, I mean, it, we had, th this mediation went through so smooth, it was about two and a half hours, I guess, and just everything clicked, 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 and and, what, and, and you got to be careful when things are just running along too smooth and you're, and you're not quite paying attention and you get a little bit lackadaisical and so we're, I'm writing up the agreement and, and asked and uh, said $500, didn't specify how it was going to be, you know, and she said, and he better not pay me in a company check because I know his company checks bounce. <laughs> well, you know, I wasn't prepared for that. You know, and he says, "What do you mean my company checks bounce? That happened only twice <laughs> in the last six years." Well, but they have bounced before, so I said, "Well, how would you prefer the payment?" And she said, "Cashier's check." I said, "How would cashier's check be for you?" Nope, I'm only going to write her a company check. He was adamant; he wasn't going to go any special effort to get her any particular kinds of funds. Okay, and so I so now I'm back in my mediator mode again. I've I've woken back up since everything has has gotten off kilter for a second. So I just turn to her and I say, "Well, in your business, what happens? What do you do if you if you get a bad check? Well, I report it to the uh, I I take it right down to the district attorney's office. And so and then she's thinking, oh. I hope he gives me a bad check. <laughs> I mean, she didn't say that, but you could read it in her eyes. Okay, I'll take his company check, you know, and, and solved it just by turning around and asking her, how do you normally take care of a situation like that? Okay, so very good point. I'm glad, glad you brought that up, Vic. Uh, uh, pay $500 by company check. We could slide that in there. 
buy company check, okay? Uh, in one payment, no later than 30 June. So we've covered the, the what, the when, the where, and the how. And, and that, was, that was the part that I thought y'all were missing is by, obviously you can't mail, you shouldn't mail cash through the mail, okay? So that would have eliminated that. That would have either changed up the, if she demanded cash, then that would have changed up the method of delivery, okay? So, and what's it for? Well, the, the what's it for part is going to be at the, at the very bottom. Now, if this is the only item, as a matter of fact, no matter how many issues you have, always add one more line at the end that, that this resolves the issues regarding this incident or this case or this whatever it is, okay? Because that gives them both a sense of closure. This resolves all of the issues regarding this situation or this case or this incident or these issues or whatever it is. Okay, I always add that as my last line. I try to always add that. Remember that. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much how you deal with money. So, so now anybody looking at this, a judge later on or some someone 10 years down the road, they can look at this and say, okay, Bill agreed to pay Sue $500 by company check in one payment, one installment. One installment's a better word. I like that, Osana. Uh, no later than 5 p.m. on 30th of June, 2004, by U.S. Postal Mail, delivered to Sue's home, which is 12 Main Street, whatever it is. Okay, 1215 Main Street. Okay, any questions about that? Yes. Uh, do you use the language Bill agrees or Bill will pay? I use Bill agrees to pay. Yeah, I always have used that terminology. I mean, it's pretty clear that, that, it's, that, that it's a will. It's not a may. Because you're just, we're kind of just jacking with legal terminology here, but it's in the agreement he agrees to pay obviously if he doesn't pay if he doesn't pay then he's not lived up to the terms of the contract or to the agreement right so okay good question though good question other questions about this because we want to make it simple we want to make it simple now if for some reason they want to convert this to some legalese document that's fine Okay, but you have this to fall back on is what the original intent of this, of, of this one section is. Okay, you want to set the times and dates and cover all the details without a great deal of compl complicated prose, as it would be. You want to try to make the agreement as balanced as possible. Do not make the agreement too one-sided. Try to balance the give and take of each party. Now, lots of times what I'll have is if, if Bill agrees to do that, the very next line I have is Sue agrees to do what? Now let's say that the whole issue, everything resolved, was just this $500. Just this one point, one issue. I'm not just going to leave Bill hanging out there by himself. My next line, second line, is going to be Sue agrees by accepting this $500 that that, that resolves all the issues to this to these allegations or to this case or whatever it might be. That way I've got Bill agreeing to something and Sue agreeing to something, okay? And that'll, that'll keep it balanced. That'll keep the ledger balanced, okay? And it'll feel like they both have ownership of the, they're both agreeing to do something, okay? Uh, lots of times though, I mean, this is, this is very simple. I, it's rare, matter of fact, I can't even think of a situation where it was just a one or two line item issue. There, there's always multiple issues. Like, I don't ever want him calling my house again. Okay, so um, what I'm hearing you say is you don't want him calling your house anymore. How else is it, uh, what about your office? No, I don't want him calling my office anymore. Well, instead of start, when they start that, instead of, I said, well, how would it be if we worded it to say that Bill agrees not to contact you by telephone, by any, any, by any method. That's the way I want it, okay? 
Now we're talking about after, after you get your money, after you get your check, because that, con that constitutes a contact. Okay, so be careful that you're not setting yourself up to violate something you've already previously agreed to also. Okay. Okay, so let's... You just had to get in the picture, didn't you? Yeah. Okay. Patty, you better not create an outtag video. I'm telling you. Okay. Okay. Be positive wherever possible. Phrase points of agreement in the following terms. Uh, of, of what the parties agree to do, not in terms of what they won't do or stop doing, okay? Now, sometimes that's going to be very, very difficult to do, okay? So you've, you've got to be able to turn a negative, a negative action or a negative phrase into a, a uh, in, in the future, they will refrain from contacting you in any, in any they will, instead of stop doing whatever it is they're doing. Uh, steer clear of judgmental expressions such as good behavior. Okay, well, someone now is going to start acting right. And I want you to put that in that agreement, that they're going to start acting right. Okay, well, what does that really mean? They're going to start acting right. They're going to have a better attitude. Okay, well, what is having a better attitude? Describe what that is. Well, by acting right, I want them to quit doing you know, I want them to quit calling me at 3 o'clock in the morning. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say is, is that, is that you don't want to receive any calls before what time? Okay, and so couch it in those terms. Take it out of the subjective and make it, or out of the objective and make it specific. Okay. Um, never include admissions of guilt in a mediated agreement. Why do you think that would be important? To not include admissions of guilt. Why, why would you not include, Sonny, why would you not include admission of guilt? One reason, that's why you're having a mediation is so no one will find guilt in a civil suit. That's why you have settlements and non-suits of the, the okay. main issues. Okay, good point. The, remember, the mediation is not to find out who's right or wrong, although typically we find out they're both wrong in some form or fashion. But we're not trying to find out who's innocent or guilty. We're not trying to find out who's right or wrong. We want to reach a resolution. And so... From time to time, you're going to have some folks demand, and they'll say this, I demand that you put in there that he admits he was wrong or that he admits that he did this. Well, as soon as somebody says that or uses that phrase, I say, well, I, I turn to them and ask them, how will that help us resolve this situation? How will that help? By him admitting to this or her admitting to this, how does that help us resolve these issues. Well, it'll make me feel better. Okay. Well, tell me how it's going to make you feel better. Well, because I know he's wrong. Okay. By him admitting it, how is that going to make you feel better? Okay. So, you can get them. Matter of fact, all the agreements, I've never even come close to putting anything on there where somebody admitted guilt. Now, many times People want an apology, okay? And they want a written apology. Now, this is a very, very delicate thing that, that you need to handle on apologies, okay? Let's talk about an apology, okay? Somebody wants an apology. Well, this poor old Bill and Sue, they've had all kinds of problems, so let's just give them this problem as well. Bill says, well, I want her to apologize. And... Sue says, well, okay, I'll apologize. Well, first of all, when, when, when do you want the apology? Okay. Well, I want it. I want the apology right now. Okay. Or I want the apology next week. Or I want the apology done in an open forum. Or I want a written apology. Okay. Well, there's all different kinds of apologies. And you can lose all of the great efforts that you've done up to this point by screwing up apology issues. And you write more apology stuff than you do any other type of, of, uh, of resolutions 
to agreements has been my experience. At least apologies are typically part of a lot of them. So on an apology, ask, I would ask the person who is asking the apology what they want the apology to say, how they want the apology presented, and even to the point of giving them an example of what they would like the apology to say, even for them to write it out so that we can look at it, okay? Because just because somebody apologizes, okay, well, I apologize. Well, that, I don't call that an apology. Okay, well, what do you call an apology? Well, I want him to say, I want him to admit he did it, and I want him to apologize. Well, we've already agreed that we're not going to have anybody admit anything, okay? So now, I've, I've helped folks write lots of apology statements that are really non-apologies. You know, they're, you know, I apologize if you didn't, if you couldn't understand what I was saying, you know. Is, do you like that as an apology? Okay. And of course, a lot of it's tone of voice, too. You know, I apologize if, you know, you're stupid. You know. So, you know, you need, to, you need to make sure that by, that's why you want the person who is requesting the apology, put the focus all right back on them and ask them how, what would they like the apology to, to read? How would they like the apology to read? What do they want in the apology? And how do they want the apology presented? Okay? Because if you, because no matter what the other side says, it's not going to be good enough, maybe, for, for the other side. And they have in mind kind of what they want to say anyway. Okay? But let that be your starting point. Don't let that be your ending point. Okay? And if they want to write it out, then, you know, let's make it part of the agreement. You know, the apology will say, I apologize for any misunderstanding we might have had regarding whatever it is. And that's always kind of a safe, safe, neutral, non-specific apology. Okay? But they're getting an apology. Okay? Don't just leave it open-ended out there that, that uh, Sue will apologize to Bill, you know, at the, at the pulpit at, uh, at, at next Sunday service, and then, and then she goes up there and she just lambasts him, although she's calling it an apology. And so now you've got another, another conflict. You violated the prime directive again. Okay. Uh, also steer clear of, of uh, words such as making people agree that, that they're not going to do, any, do something anymore or do something again, which once again would imply guilt. Uh, try to use terms such as they agree to. Remember I showed you, you know, Bill agrees to. Uh, instead of must or should, because once again, must or should are more of a demanding, even though in, in the contract context that we have it here, it really means the same thing, they're going to. Actually, should though, should is not really as binding on them because it just says, well, he should do that. doesn't mean he has to do that. But if you say agrees to, well, you know, he's saying he's going to do it. Don't use ambiguous words such as soon or because soon is relative, right? Um, you know, you tell your, your teenager to take the trash out and he says five more minutes. Well, that five more minutes can mean anywhere from two hours to the next day, right? So soon is, is a relative term. Reasonable, well, what's reasonable? Reasonable for what may be reasonable for me may not be reasonable for you. Uh, asking somebody to be cooperative. Well, people are always going to use these terms, but be more, get them, narrow them down to more specifics. What does cooperative mean? When you ask me to be more cooperative, what specifically are you asking me to do? Well, I want you to be on time. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say is, is that you want them to be on time. Now, what do you mean by on time? Because on time to some people means five minutes late. Five minutes late still means that they're on time. It depends on the culture. It depends on what you're used to. It depends on what your expectations are. So. You know, you may even need to narrow down that phrase, and that's why in our family, which nobody in here, I don't want anybody to talk to my wife about this, but, you know, we intentionally 
tell her family to be someplace 30 minutes later than it starts so that they'll be on time because they're always 30 minutes late. So if a graduation is at 2 o'clock, we tell them it starts at 1.30 so that they're there by 2 o'clock. Okay, does that make sense? I know some of y'all are going to rat me out. <sighs> so. Okay, avoid wording statements that can be interpreted in more than one way and cause new misunderstandings between the parties. The mediator should not allow the parties present at the hearing to agree that the person who is not present will perform any function in the agreement. Remember, we kind of talked about this the first night. You can't make agreements to anybody requiring somebody to perform that's not part of the mediation process. You need to provide for future, for the future, encourage the parties to think about ways to communicate if more than one problem should come up, okay? You can always add a line on the mediation that if there is, that if they have futures in the problem, they will, they will agree to go to mediation, okay? That's always a very good clause to put in there. It doesn't mean they have to come back to you. As a matter of fact, you, you, know, you kind of hope you don't ever see these people again, okay? But by putting a clause in there, uh, as a matter of fact, we're working on one right now, a case where the, uh, uh, it's a uh, modification of a divorce decree and there's actually a statement in that the court put in there that before they can actually file in court, the parties have to, have to attempt a mediation. The judge is apparently, whatever judge saw this, he. He wants somebody else to mess with these people before he gets an opportunity to see them again, okay? Because he's mandating that they that they see media that they seek mediation on any disagreements with the or problems with the uh, with the agreement. You want to write the agreement in a format that's going to be acceptable to both parties. Now, let's talk about that for just a second. What happens in a lot of mediators? say, well, you know, we're just the mediator. We're not going to write up the agreement. We think that we're going to lose our neutrality if we write up the agreement. Now, I don't know where that philosophy came from because, you know, I think writing up the agreement is going to help avoid further conflict because you're the most experienced person with writing up agreements, not the participants, okay? And so many mediators teach, just take the agreement form, put it in the middle of the table, and let them write up their own agreement. Well. There's all kinds of bad things that can happen if you do that. First of all, you set it out there in the middle, and what if they both grab for it at the same time? You know, and then you got a wrestling match going on. That would be worse. That, or that would be pretty bad. But what might be worse is you set it out there in the middle of the table, and neither one of them want it. Okay, so then what do you have to? You have to pull it back and do what you should have done in the first place. And what I do is, is when I write when I write these agreements, is as I'm putting it on paper, I write slow enough that I speak the words that I'm writing down on paper so they hear exactly what I'm writing and committing to paper. Okay, so in this other example, I would say Bill agrees to pay, and when she jumped up and said not for him not to write a company check, that she wouldn't take a company check. And so, and that lets you deal with those issues as you're writing, as you're putting them down on paper. Okay, so that way you don't write this whole long document and then you pass it around to them to read and they say, well, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like the way this is worded, you know, and you're starting over again. So what you want to do is take your time, write and speak exactly as you're writing it down so they know exactly. And I tell them I'm doing this. I say, well, so that y'all know what I'm writing down, I'm just going to, I'm going to read it as I write it. I'm going to read it as I write it. Okay. And now I don't tell them if they have suggestions to let me know because if I tell them that to make suggestions as I go, I guarantee you they'll both have suggestions. And if one has a suggestion, that means the other one's going to have to have a suggestion so that they can get their their ten cents worth in. Okay. Um, the agreement must be signed by everyone present who is involved in the dispute, and will have a role in upholding the agreement. The mediators may sign as witnesses. Well, my rules are the mediators always sign as a witness. And if they are, if they are in the room, I don't care if they're in the room as an observer. 
if they are in the room, if they participated in the mediation session, everyone's going to sign that document. Now, the observer may sign as a witness, uh, but every, every person that's in that room is going to sign that document. Yes. The attorneys. The attorneys, yes. The attorneys, they also sign it? Yes. As? Especially the attorneys. As? As the counselor, attorney. as representative for, uh, on, on the agreement they can write, as counsel or whatever, however they would normally write it. Now, some of the forms specifically say counsel for the plaintiff, counsel for the defendant. But I've eliminated all that off of my stuff because I don't want, see, I think the terms plaintiff and defendant are negative terms because they're not plaintiff and defendant in the mediation. You know, they're equal parties. And I don't want to con constantly rub that in someone's face that, well, I was the one that filed, so I'm the plaintiff, and, and they filed it against me, so I'm the defendant. So in the mediation, you know, you're not a plaintiff and a defendant. You're just parties. And uh, so the, the attorneys sign it uh, as representative or counsel for who, uh, whoever they're, they're representing. Good, good question. Uh, make sure that all parties should have a copy of the agreement. If a photocopier is available, provide the copies before they leave. If not, arrange to mail copies to all the signatories as soon as possible. Okay? Don't tell them you're going to type this up nice and pretty and then mail it out for them to sign because odds are they're not going to sign it later. So get them to sign it then. So long as you've got the original, that's the most important thing at that particular time. And you can always get them copies later. But I've been fortunate enough to be in areas where there was either a copy or available, or the agreements were short enough that I could just, if, if somebody had to have a copy right now, I just rewrite it. Have everybody sign the second, the second sheet. Okay. Uh, if there's going to be any money to be exchanged, uh, it may go through the mediator in the form of a check or money order if the parties would prefer not to make a direct exchange. I kind of... That is one method. That's the way some mediators handle it. Um, I always try to refrain from that because the parties want to ask that from time to time. Well, can we just mail you the check? And, you know, if a check comes to, to my house, my wife thinks that's hers. You know, so it's best if, if they'll just make the contact with each other so that instead of making you as the intermediary. There are some situations, though, where because of things that have happened in the past, um, uh, we've had people agree to meet at a police station or a fire station to exchange envelopes. Uh, you know, envelopes get exchanged at police stations all the time, right, Byron? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but you want them, if, if, if it's not going to be something by mail, and, they, and like if they're going to exchange cash, they should always do it in some public area, some, some place where both parties are going to feel safe and secure. Uh, you need to ensure that the check or the money order is not made out to the mediator but has the appropriate uh, party's name as the payee. Also make sure that all the details regarding the exchange are clearly covered as we did up here by the address, the names, and the phone numbers. When drafting the agreement, write in full dates, including the year. Don't use abbreviations. Don't write like 04 slash 04 slash or 04 slash 03 04, okay? Because that could be interpreted so many different ways. You know, in, in some cultures that might be, well, in our culture that could be April the 3rd, but Jennifer, March, yeah, April the 3rd, or it might be March the 4th. And there's a big difference between April the 3rd and March the 4th. So, so write it out. Um, if the mediator is drafting the agreement at the dictation of the parties, use the real names in the agreement and not such shorthand or jargon as, as IP, initiating party, or RP, responding party, plaintiff, defendant, complainant, manager, owner. Uh, now, I typically, like I do up here, like I showed you, I'll, I'll use their first names. If, if that's what's in the style up here, and uh, I, I don't write out their full name on each sentence. I'll say Bill agrees to if he's the only Bill involved, Sue agrees to if she's the only Sue involved, and so forth. Um, if attorneys for the parties are drafting the agreement and they use such shorthand or jargon, do not object. After all, 
uh, they are the ones who are going to be transforming it into the written settlement agreement. Uh, occasionally, if there's an attorney present and they volunteer that they will, that they will convert it, then I let them convert it. But I always write up the original agreement, the, the non-legalese agreement, so that I know exactly what's in the agreement. Because even I get confused by this party, the first part, third party, second party, defendant, plaintiff, because they're going to they're going to try to use that language in their agreement. The agreement should be written in black ink, and all parties should sign in ink. Um, the signing in blue ink is is a good way to to be able the uh, for them to sign their names in a different color ink is a good way to to maintain which one's the original document. Um, if if I know that there's a, a, a copier present, a photocopy machine present, and there's, a, uh, and there's been lots and lots and lots of, they've agreed to this, but they change it up a hundred times deal, I may write that thing in pencil, okay? Because I know I'm going to be erasing every third word. And my original may be in pencil, making a copy of that document once it's finished, and have them sign, have them sign the penciled copy. Does that make sense? Right. The, it, if I it, and it just depends. And I've had a couple of those where the people were just, you know, it didn't matter. I could have written it perfect, and they both of them had changes, and because they were just trying to out, they're, they're still trying to compete with each other. They're still trying to outdo. They're still trying to get the last word in. Okay, and if they're trying to do that on every sentence, I'll just write it out in pencil, okay, so I can erase and go as I go, change it as I go, then make a copy of that document and have them sign that, okay? All right, but these are all just little, just, I just want to plant these seeds in your mind so that you can figure out how to, how to best use them. Now, obviously, if I'm in a situation where there's no photocopy available, I'm going to write the original out in ink, okay? Um, the mediator should not forget to sign as a witness. Do not add, subtract, or change anything in the agreement once it is signed unless the change is initialed by all the signatories in the agreement. Okay? Now, once you, once you have everything down, remember what it is you're not supposed to say? Is there anything else? Don't ever, ever say this. Okay? I only said this twice in my life, and both times it was like, oh my gosh, what did I do? Because then they both said, oh, well, let me think about this for a minute. And if you let them think long enough, they're going to come up, well, you know, we didn't address whatever. And they said, oh, yeah, we didn't address that either. And so now you've just opened it up a whole other can of worms. So what is it you're supposed to say? Is this your agreement? Is this your agreement? Okay, now you've already read everything out loud as you're writing, as you're writing the agreement out. You're, you've written everything. You've, you've written it as you've said it. So there's not going to be a whole lot for them to, to read or question. So you pass it. Now, I always just pass it to the closest person to me. Once again, other mediators say, well, you know, you're showing bias if you hand it to one, one party or the other. Let them read it first. Well, you know, I think you can get too, too caught up in this being 100% pure uh, as far as your perception of being you know, neutral and biased. I don't think that has anything to do with neutrality or being biased by handing it to the closest person to you. So I hand it to the closest person to me. I say everybody will have a chance to read it. If you agree with everything we have on the paper, go ahead and sign it. And then if somebody finds a misspelling or they say this needs to be changed, get it. mediator takes it back, agrees with the change, everybody else agrees with the change, you initial it, and then start it back with Start it back over again. Okay? That's only happened a few times. So it gets back to you. The everybody in the room has signed it. Mediator signed it as a witness. And especially in the uh, co mediation process, one person is in charge of, of taking care of the agreement. And the other person, what their duty is, is to gather up all of the notes that everybody's taken, including the mediators and pick them up and destroy them, okay? 
And I always have them do that in front of everybody. And by destroying them, they just, you know, tear them in half two or three times and toss them. If you have a shredder, that much better. But I don't specifically make an effort to go try to find a shredder. You tear them up a couple of times and you toss them. Uh, but I do let them see that everybody, that we have collected the notes, including the mediator's notes. But don't start tearing up notes until everybody signed the document. Okay? Um, this says pay special attention to neatness and spelling. Uh, keep a dictionary handy and refer to it. I don't use words big enough that you got to use a dictionary. So I, once again, I keep it simple enough that that's not going to be an issue. Uh, in, a, in addition to looking at professional, a badly misspelled agreement could cause future problems for the parties. If no agreement is reached, it's sometimes helpful for the parties to provide them with a concise written record of issues covered and any consensus between the parties. For an example, you could call it a memorandum for consideration. Um, we have actually done that in the past where, you know, the parties, even though they didn't sign an agreement, you know, they, they, they wanted to uh, a list of, of what was covered and we provided them that list. Of course, you know, they paid us for that. And so the question is, does that violate confidentiality of what was talked about in the mediation? Well, you're providing it to both, both sides and it's the exact same list and it's what they both agreed to. So um, I didn't have a problem with it and they both insisted on it. So we were only providing it to the two parties. Closure. The conclusion of every mediation session should include a few words from the mediator acknowledging the efforts of the parties. Uh, often emotions are high at the end of the session, uh, maybe even euphoric. Remember the example I gave you of the HUD case where, you know, the parties jumped up and hugged and kissed and I wasn't able to get in the middle of them quick enough. Um, at other times, the parties may feel tired and hopeless. I, I typically try to shake everyone's hands, thank them for participating. Now, that's whether we resolve it or not. I, I pretty much do the same thing. You know, I, I thank them for either attempting to, to reach an agreement or for participating in the mediation process. Bless you. Um, if an agreement was reached, compliment the parties on their determination to work through the situation and review what they've accomplished. Thank them for coming and for willingness to try to mediate. Tell them that if a problem develops with this or other matter, they can contact the mediation service or the mediator for further discussions. Um, now, just hold on to that thought for just a second. Um, be careful about that because if, if your time is what you're getting paid for, then there needs to be a clear understanding that you're going to charge them, you know, for any further assistance as well as they, you did for this mediation. Uh, we have a, a situation now where it seems like we've spent a whole lot more time consulting with folks than we actually did during the mediation, but, but uh, fortunately uh, there was an agreement reached uh, ahead of time and uh, they're, they're being billed just like a regular client for consultation. So, because, because people will take advantage of that opportunity if you let them. You know, they'll be calling you every day about this or that on things that, you know, they should just be putting in a formal, uh, being resolved in a formal mediation session, set, setting. Point out that, they have, that uh, they have experienced a new method of conflict resolution, which they can apply to future problems, either on their own or with the assistance of another mediator. If no agreement was reached, thank them for their willingness to try to, to mediate the issues. Compliment for their efforts. Discuss any positive things that may come from the mediation, such as increased understanding between the parties. Double check the party's understanding of the consequences of not reaching an agreement and indicate to both parties that you will, that you will provide further referral if needed. And you know, even at this stage, you still want to be user friendly. Uh, there's been several mediations where, you know, they, we, we agreed we couldn't reach a resolution. Uh, there was one case that uh, had to do, it was, a, it was a real estate case and some folks had flown in from California and some other folks had flown up from, 
from Houston, and we had mediated all morning, and the the one party had started off at about a one point two million dollars, and had had brought their requirement all the way down to about about four hundred and twenty thousand. The other party had started off at about two thousand dollars, and now they had their they had got theirs all the way up to right at uh, four hundred thousand. Bottom line is, we were within twenty thousand dollars, and. But we were all tired. We were all wiped out. I had used every trick and technique that I knew. They weren't going to, the, the group from Houston wasn't going to come up another 20,000, and the group from California wasn't going to come down anymore. And so we, we were having to wrap it up and end the session, and they agreed that they were just going to see each other in court. And even by talking to them about what the costs were that they were going to expend, they were both willing to spend $20,000 each in court which is, it, it probably would have cost about that much because they, they still hadn't done depositions yet, they hadn't gone through that process. So uh, as, the, as the one group is walking down the hallway towards the elevator, I thought, you know, what have I got to lose? So I, the party that was just sitting there, now, and we had already talked about this earlier, I said, look, you guys are going to fly back to Houston, you're going to have to, wh what are you going to be doing? Well, I guess we'll start working on our case. I said, I said, boy, you, that's the only case you guys got to work on. Well, no, actually, we were hoping we would get this resolved today. Well, would y'all split the difference? Even though that had already been suggested earlier, but now it was reality. The mediation was over. Everybody had shaken. It was a very amicable thing. Everybody had shaken hand. All the attorneys had shaken hand. They were, they were walking towards the elevator, and they said, $10,000? Yeah, we do that. I said, okay. So... I ran down the hall as I could only run down the hall. And fortunately, it was in a federal building, so the elevators were very, very slow. <laughs> and uh, they were all still waiting for the elevator to come, come up. And I said, you know, I was just talking to these guys, and, and they said they really would like to get this resolved today, and uh, they'd be willing to split the difference. And these guys looked at each other, because you know they were tired, beat. They were about to get on a plane, and they said, hmm, ten thousand dollars? That doesn't sound too bad." Okay, yeah, let's do it. They walked back down the end of the hall. It took me about ten minutes to write up the agreement. So it was, you know, everything was done. And so sometimes, you know, trying that last ditch effort, because now all the pressure's off of them. Okay, they, they've they've agreed that they're that they're not going to get this resolved today, and they're just going to move go on down the road. But now, but we weren't talking about $1.2 million now, and we weren't talking about $400,000 now. All we were talking about was $10,000. But we were talking about more than that, but that's all that, that now that the pressure was off of them to try to get it, because now they're going home, and they're going home, and it uh, doesn't always work, but it worked in that case, and it has worked in other cases when everybody's shaking hands and they're about to leave and just try that one last ditch effort. Okay, and we got it resolved, and everybody was happy. You know, but remember, we had already suggested this a little bit. We're only within twenty thousand dollars. I don't care. We're not going to give in anymore. We've given in all day, and both sides are saying the same thing. We've given in all day. We're not going to give in anymore. Okay, so get the pressure off of them. Say, okay, well the mediation's over. Everybody's friendly and going home. Okay. Um, indicate to the part, both parties once again that you'll provide further <coughs> referral if needed. Uh, Post-mediation procedures for the mediator. If the mediators are working within a large agency or firm and are not full-time employees, reminders of the following need to take place. That, uh, you know, they need to return any files that they've, that they've gathered. Um, they need to brief the staff case manager. Now, let, let's talk about this for just a second. That and the debriefing. Uh, if, if you're on your own out there, um, you know, you need to you need to to debrief with somebody. Uh, it, if you're doing these volunteer mediations and you're in a situation or you're in a position or you're in a role where the uh, you know you have a staff that you can debrief because you can you can think through the process and you can kind of you as the mediator can have closure and let this thing go to and move on. Uh, and so, 
you know, lots of times I'll debrief with maybe not officially a debrief session, but debriefing is very, very valuable for you as a mediator. Sometimes I debrief with my wife. I change the names and the scenarios and just say, you know, this is, this is kind of what's happened, and, and I probably could have done this better, or I could have done this technique earlier, faster, quicker, or I'll never do that little technique again because that didn't work with the flip. You know, but talking it through with somebody who will actually listen to you. I guess I just admitted my wife listens to me, didn't I? Okay. okay. Any questions about writing agreements? I mean, it's all downhill once you get to the point where you're going to write an agreement, but you want to make sure that you don't create new problems. Layla? How big can it be? You can just write it however long you want to. It needs to be as long as it needs to be to cover all of the issues involved. Now, as you notice, some of the examples that I, I have here uh, that we gave you in, your, in the notes book where there's an example of agreement writing, there's one page that's just a kind of an open-ended page. And so if you need to use five, six, or ten sheets of that, I think the longest agreement I've ever written is about five or six pages, and that was a divorce decree that had every issue in the world in it. The majority of, of cases I've written up, the majority of those are on one page. Matter of fact, all the style information's at the top. The everything that's being agreed to is in the body of the of the agreement, and then all the signature pages are on the bottom. Um, one of the things that we didn't touch on that you do, and I'm glad you brought that up, was however many pages you end up with, number your pages. Your first page is going to be one of however many you end up with. Okay, and always number your pages as the very last thing that you do. Okay, because you don't want to number them and then, oh, they've added something else or something's been changed. Okay, bless you. Okay, good question. Yeah, it needs to be as long as it needs to be to cover all of the issues involved. Yes, ma'am. Then after you give them uh, the agreement, then, then what happens with it? They take it to their lawyer? Well, it, it depends on what environment we're talking about. Me, you remember, many of these mediations are, have nothing to do with the court system. Many of these, if it's an employment case, if it's a housing case, if it's a, uh, just a, a domestic case, a civil case, some of, some of these have nothing whatsoever to do with the court system. If, if it's been a court-referred or a court-ordered or a court-mandated mediation, somebody's got to take it to the court and file it with the court, okay? And typically, if it's a court-ordered or a court-referred or a court-mandated mediation, one or both of the parties has an attorney, okay? And it just takes one attorney to file it. So you just find out which one of them still has an attorney on retainer and let that attorney file it, okay? I always keep the original, okay? I always keep the original copy. That way, whatever's, whatever's been filed or sent, just in case there's some question about something, somebody accusing something of somebody changing something, then, you know, I have the original. Okay? Now, you know, lots, if you have neighborhood disputes, if you have, remember, don't get all hung up with this court-appointed mediation stuff, because I think that it represents about 5% of the mediation opportunities that are out there. Uh, if you're doing a mediation for a commission or a city, they have their own process. You know, you just hand it over to them and they include it in the file. For example, all the mediations I do for the City of Fort Worth Human Relations Commission, all of those are, you know, when, when they sign the dotted line, that closes the case. All they do is they take that, they attach it to a document that says the parties have agreed to the attached terms, case closed, okay? Uh, on a housing case, the same thing, where we, have a, where we do mediations for the uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. We have my handwritten, not typed, handwritten, signed agreement. Now, something that is a little bit different in some of these, uh, uh, for example, the EEOC and HUD and, and the cities uh, do require that, the, that when the parties sign that they have a notary, you know, verify their signature, okay? But that's, that's it, that's, that's the only difference between that. So you've got a handwritten, bless you, you've got a handwritten document and it's got a, a notary stamp on it that they verified what the person's signature is. Yes? Don't you have to be in front of the notary to sign it? Don't you have to be in front of a notary public to sign it though? Yes. So you basically have to have an additional person in there. Well, they only, they, 
the document has to be notarized. Uh, now, the mediations that I'm doing for the city, those are between, because it's mandated by contract, those have to be done between 8 o'clock and 5 o'clock. The city has their own notaries. Same thing with HUD, those have to be done between 8 o'clock and 5 o'clock. I mean, they have their rules for when things have to be conducted. Uh, other than those environments in the city of Dallas doing theirs, city of Dallas doesn't require that the signatures be notarized. Okay, so like I say, it depends on whatever the environment is, but all I'm doing is taking the handwritten agreement and turning it over to whatever the agency or the department is and they're closing the case out. Okay, uh, and if it's an employment, uh, lots of the mediations that I've done are between employer, employee, because that's what their employment agreement called for. You know, all they're doing is they're taking that agreement, the parties are getting a, a copy of it, and that it, it goes no further. I mean, there's, there's no other place to send it to. Yes, sir. Do you still keep a copy for your own records? Absolutely. Yes, sir. I always keep a copy. Okay. Good questions. A other questions that you might have? Yes, sure. In the example you gave earlier where an agreement wasn't reached and then in the hallway you reached one, if you had written up the memorandum for consideration or completion and then had moved on and reached an agreement, do you write somewhere then on the new agreement that this overrides precincts? I mean, is that something that should be included somewhere or do you just destroy the old one? You mean, and we just did it 30 minutes apart? Yeah, like, I mean, if it's, oh, something yeah. was reached in the hallway. Okay, right so you don't anyone. need to keep those on file? Okay. No, I haven't filed them yet. Well, I mean, for your files, I mean, it was so it's something that would just be destroyed. Right. I mean, it, it depends on what the environment is. Now, sometimes when there's been a couple of times where, you know, we've agreed on some issues, people come back and they, and we renegotiate those or they want to remediate those issues and finish up the other issues, then, you know, we're, I'm basically, I start with a new document. I said, this is what we've agreed to as to this date and, and move forward. 